Dr. Sean McCarthy. Um, Sean is an assistant professor in the School of Writing, Rhetoric, and Textual Communication at James Madison University. His teaching and research are situated at the intersection of community engagement and digital media studies. He co-teaches an annual faculty institute in digital humanities pedagogy at JMU and has served as a faculty associate with the Center for Instructional Technology. A winner of many grants and awards for his work, Sean has collaborated with students, faculty, and off-campus partners to create innovative community engagement projects, both locally and internationally. And he's an all-around awesome guy. So I'm going to turn things over to Sean. He's going to talk for about 25, 30 minutes, and then we will workshop. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Kate. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to see us this morning. It's a great turnout. I hope food's good. Um, thanks to Kate and John for organizing uh, the event. I've known Kate for years. I had the great pleasure of working with her at UT Austin, and I'm sure she's going to do great things here. So it's really nice to come and meet you all and talk about um, the digital humanities and such things. So the story begins a couple of years ago, actually, when I was asked by our dean in the School at uh, the College of Arts and Letters at James Madison University uh, to develop a faculty institute uh, centered around the digital humanities. And he asked um, um, two of us, uh, myself and a colleague from the Department of History, Andrew, Andrew Whitmer, to develop an institute. So we said, sure. And then we started to look at what that might be. And a couple of things came up really uh, quickly. First of all, there isn't a clear consensus as to what the digital humanities actually is. <laughs> and that, pro that proved to be a little bit of a problem uh, when you're trying to develop an institute, a faculty institute around it. And the second thing that we noticed really quickly as well is that the digital humanities is gen generally lives in research intensive institutions. So they, it, you'll often find digital humanities centers such as there are at Stanford and they generally go for very big grants and very intensive research projects that a lot of the time in, uh, um, in the, uh, are situated around building the tools that they're going to use and it's very high tech and it's very forbidding to those of us who aren't so high tech. So. James Madison University is a comprehensive four-year institution, a liberal arts focused, so we're very similar to you guys in that way. We're a lot bigger, there's 21,000 students, and it's a public, uh, it's a public institution, but, it, but we're, we, we face the similar issues to what you face here if you're trying to think about um, um, uh, developing the digital humanities on campus here. So what we're going to do today is uh, three things. I'm going to start off with a kind of a presentation, um, conference presentation style talk around the digital humanities in liberal arts context. And I'm going to ask us to think about um, uh, the digital humanities in terms of values rather than in terms of technology. So the technology is actually less important than it is a way of doing things. I wanted to just tease out what that might be. Um, and to show you a bunch of projects that uh, are totally doable in a liberal arts context, uh, particularly for professors like me who I'm interested in the technology, I'm not a coder, I want the technology to be secondary to the content that I teach, and how you might develop projects where it doesn't topple the pedagogy of your classes or the content of your classes. So we'll look at a, a, a couple of projects like that. And now I've, I've got a handout that I'm going to distribute after that. It'll probably take about 25, 30 minutes. I've got a handout that, I've got to, that I'll distribute with those values. I just want you to brainstorm among yourselves about how you might begin to either develop an assignment that's a, D, a DH-inflected assignment, if you will, based on these values, or maybe remix an assignment that you already have, or if you're involved in administration, what these values might actually say to the development of digital humanities culture on campus. We'll do that for 15 or 20 minutes, depending on how you enjoy the exercise, and then we'll kind of open it back up for a conversation for the last half an hour or so. Now, I totally understand that this two-hour period is a busy, t not necessarily for the students, but for you, it's a busy time. You've got lots of things going on. Feel free to uh, walk in and out, you know, whatever you need to do during the talk, that's absolutely fine. Um, the presentation slides that I have are uh, they're Google Slides, uh, so I've got a, I'll give the, the, the URL to Kate. I've also got a, a handout called DH Toolkit, which we share with our faculty, which has got a whole bunch of resources to get you started. So both of those links um, are available to you, um, as are all the links to all the projects that I'll be talking about. And any other kinds of resources that you um, would like, um, feel free to contact me. But everything that's going to be here today is easily accessible to you, so you don't have to take loads of notes. And I have to get back into presentation. 
Okay. So let's start with uh, the presentation part. Valuing the digital humanities in a liberal arts institution, right, and liberal arts institutions. There was a definite buzz in the room on an otherwise ordinary Friday morning last semester. Faculty, administrators, librarians, and educational technologists had gathered to hear future plans for our university's classrooms. A communications professor described an assignment in which students reflected on their se semester's work uh, working through issues of race and class by using comic life to narrate their experience in short graphic novels. A rhetoric professor dreamed aloud about working with students to build a participatory archive that collected popular representations of pregnancy for scholarly annotation, analysis, and remixing. A health studies professor explained how she was going to have her online health class, class create posters targeted at the local LGBTQ community on campus and in Harrisonburg, our local city. <coughs> Two graduate students in English, working with a nursing school professor, created an assignment for, history of for a history of nursing class that annotated archival photographs of nurses and hospitals to explore the historical context of their profession. The energy and nature of the conversation in the room was extraordinary. Ideas flowed across disciplinary boundaries. Librarians in the audience pushed humanities professors uh, toward different ways of thinking about archives, and political scientists and foreign language instructors swapped strategies for improving assignments. The setting of the showcase uh, presentations was for the Digital Humanities and Social Sciences Institute, a six-week training seminar for faculty on our campus, James Madison University. Participants from five disciplines across the humanities and social and health sciences were presenting assignments they had worked for for over six weeks alongside readings, discussions, and workshops based on digital humanities research and pedagogy. The institute was designed by me, a writing studies professor, and Andrew, a history professor, and that's a, a, a little um, a snapshot of the comic that, the, that I showed you earlier, and it calls me a wizard, so like any time I've got an option for myself, a wizard, I'm going to go the screen. Um, we've, taught the, we've taught the Institute a few times in as many years. Among the greatest challenges we have faced in introducing newcomers to the digital humanities is the sheer diversity of the field. The digital humanities, um, um, uh, digital humanists orient their work variously around research, pedagogy, theory, and methodology. And I've kind of got a, a, a sort of a quick way of describing it um, that's not in any way formal, but I tend to think of the digital humanities in four different ways. As an ethic, as a pitch, as an interface, and as a critique. As an ethic, it's a way of doing things. It's really based more about how to do things rather than about content. The content is secondary to the methodology, and that's really a kind of a, a core thing about the digital humanities. It's like, how can we do this differently rather than what is it, right? So it's a methodological uh, uh, approach. Um, it's a critique insofar as that many digital humanists uh, are critical of uh, uh, scholarly production, weight, uh, solo authorship, print-bound journals, uh, journals that uh, exist behind firewalls, access to knowledge, is a strong vein of thought in the digital humanities. It's also a critique of traditional uh, humanities teaching and scholarship and how we might improve it through digital humanities means. Um, it's a pitch in that it's a way to get money. It's a way for uh, uh, folks to combine ideas under the umbrella of the digital humanities and then go for a mail grant or some such so that they can actually uh, form ideas or, or create projects that uh, will get funded. So it's a pitch. And to me, the most interesting one is that it's an interface. And this is what I really enjoy about it, uh, working in the digital humanities area, is that it's a way for different disciplines to have fun conversations about doing things together. So I see it as an, inter as an interface to dis interdisciplinarity. And that's fundamentally what it is. In fact, I think the term the digital humanities is likely to recede into the background as we stop focusing or kind of fetishizing the digital and we really think about it being as a gateway to doing more creative and interesting interdisciplinary work, right? So they're the four ways that I like to think about it because there really isn't one formal definition of the digital humanities that's going to satisfy everybody and anybody in the room. In fact, just last month, there was the day of DH where digital humanities practitioners from all over the world get online and they form their own definitions of the digital humanities. So like, we redefine it every year thousands and thousands of times. It's a complete nerd fest. And it doesn't leave anyone any the wiser as to what it is. Right. So I think the easiest way to think about it is that it's really a gateway towards interdisciplinary culture as a way of making projects sustainable and, to, and, 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 and really a focus on methodology. 
So um, many, in fact, uh, uh, many scholars, in fact, argue that DH is better understood as a variety of methodological approaches to the humanities questions than it is a unified field. Another important challenge for us has been charting an approach to the digital humanities that fits with our particular kind of institution, a mid-sized public university with an undergraduate focus and a strong commitment to teaching and the liberal arts. Spurred on by these challenges, we have developed a, a, a digital humanities ped pedagogy based upon a framework of values, critical thinking, collaboration, production, and openness that we call our CCPO framework. Over the past three years of teaching the Institute, we have found that these, this values-based pedagogy accommodates and actually draws strengths from the diversity of digital humanities, leveraging the lack of clear definition that initially made DH so challenging, and even advancing new forms of interdisciplinary practice. While the energizing collaborative atmosphere of the Friday uh, morning showcase that I just mentioned uh, seemed effortless, it was actually the fruit of this value-based approach to digital humanities pedagogy at the undergraduate level. And this, the CCPO framework and much of the text that I'm reading today is from an article that I wrote with my co-facilitator, Andrew Whitmer from the Department of History, that's going to be coming out in uh, hybrid pedagogy in the next month or two. So the entire text, well, it's a larger text, but this text will be online um, on that, in that journal soon. Um, the values in our CCPO framework are well represented in much of the digital humanities literature, and they speak to the consistent call that DH is not just about doing the humanities digitally, but it is a means of transforming how we theorize and practice the humanities more broadly. Using the growth of our institute as a backdrop, I want to explore how our CCPO framework might make good on that promise of transformation, particularly at institutions such as ours. Uh, while we and others have found the CCPO framework to be valuable for students in the courses we teach, our focus here is on our work with faculty and staff and its implications for larger discussions about DH pedagogy and the place of the digital humanities on liberal arts campuses. As Brian Alexander and Rebecca Frost Davis suggest, uh, liberal arts institutions often avoid or find it difficult to sustain digital humanities projects, largely because DH often comes in the form of resource and intensive uh, resource and intensive uh, centers with a strong graduate focused research mandate that does not always align well with undergraduate teaching focused campuses. However, a liberal arts focus, we'd suggest, aligns well with digital humanities, and we believe that our CCPO framework <coughs> might serve as a values-driven, yet practical way to bridge DH and the liberal arts on campuses where DH might not ordinarily take hold. So, um, there are compelling reasons for digital humanis humanists for all, from all types of institutions to define, to define their work around values. In her article, This Is Why We Fight, Lisa Spiro calls for digital humanists to unite around core values rather than, quote, particular methods or theoretical approaches. Spiro argues for a values-driven understanding of DH, mainly because it promises to make room for all sorts of practitioners, including those primarily interested in coding, theorizing, or teaching. Focusing on what uh, unites digi digital humanities rather than who is in or who is out, she suggests, facilitates cooperation in facing common challenges. Unlike an ethics statement, which tends to demarcate standards and the behaviors that might reach those standards, Spiro notes that a value statement is somewhat broader, a grounds for conversation and debate. I think this really suits you here with your 1-0, the, the Humanities Undergraduate Seminar, which is also built around values, right? So I see there's ways that the values that we're going to talk about today might actually fit very well in with that, with that um, uh, first year program. Um, a values-driven understanding of the digital humanities is therefore particularly useful on liberal arts campuses because it can successfully invite dialogue about how the digital humanities might connect with and advance the local institutional mission even when the relationship is not all that readily apparent. So, the, so the, we see the, the, the values really as a kind of a passport, both to uh, uh, doing digital work and focusing on the values rather than the digital, but also having the digital humanities speak across institutional boundaries. So we work a lot with our Center for Teaching and Learning, we, which we call the Center for Instruction and Technology. We work with our research office because we're able to explain the work not in terms of the technology, but in terms of the values that we're actually trying to promote. Spiro's own proposed set of values, collaboration, openness, collegiality, connectedness, experimentation, and diversity, they certainly inspire our own set of values and are threaded throughout our CCPO framework. 
However, our values-driven project differs somewhat from Spiro's, which by design addresses all institutional contexts. So this is kind of a big, broad umbrella of values. Um, we have crafted and clarified CCP over the three years that we've been teaching the Institute, um, uh, such that it, its values are tailored to our kind of institution, and more specifically to our own university, which particularly prizes teaching, undergraduate research, and community and civic engagement. Um, our decision to lead with pedagogy-driven values reflects our commitment to an understanding of DH in which pedagogy is central rather than peripheral. peripheral. And here I'm, I'm, I'm drawing on a, a, a growing vein of digital humanities scholarship which says, hey, nobody's talking about the pedagogy. Nobody's talking about it in the undergraduate classroom. Where is that? So there's a book um, edited by Brett Hirsch that came out two years ago called The Digital Humanities Pedagogy, which was the first real entry into uh, thinking about uh, uh, digital humanities from a classroom perspective. Mostly the projects, uh, digital humanities projects, tend to be research focused, and they tend to be, as I say, coming out of centers that involve a network of collaborators from that institution. <coughs> As Ryan Cordell has noted, we must think locally and create versions of DH that make sense, not at some ideal level, ideal universal level, but at specific schools, in specific curricula, and with specific institutional partners. Our value system is remixed from a larger set of ideas common to DH conversations to suit our aims, and is similarly open to and in invites remix to suit other contexts and goals. And maybe that's something we can discuss when we get to, to, to chat about this, is what kind of DH practice would you like here? What are the values that are really central to the Watford mission that could be interpreted or, 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 or um, folded into a set of values that might be seen as digital humanities values? With this sensitivity to context in mind, it is worth briefly contextualizing what each of our CCPO values entails. I'm just going to give you a second to read the first, which is critical thinking. So, at first blush, Critical thinking might seem like a throwback to a more traditional framing of the humanities as a mode of analysis and critique in comparison to the digital humanities emphasis on doing and building. Tom Scheinfeld and Matt Kirschenbaum frame the digital humanities as being primarily about method over theory. Similarly, Anne Burdick and others suggest in, the digital, in digital Humanities, which is an MIT book, which is a free PDF download and is really excellent, uh, that the project is the primary unit of analysis that the project is the primary unit of analysis in DH, and that foregrounds the emphasis of the, of the field on building knowledge from the ground up. While we embrace this shift from theory to method and gloss critical thinking as a kind of critical doing in our institute discussions, it nev uh, nevertheless find critical thinking to be a useful value within the parameters of our institute and liberal arts culture in general. We are working with faculty from many disciplines, most of whom are new to the digital humanities, and many of whom are new to digital who are new to digital technologies beyond content management systems such as Blackboard or Canvas. We've discovered that critical thinking can be used as an effective bridging mechanism between the modes of thinking with which our colleagues are familiar and the more production-oriented practices of the digital humanities. Jeffrey McClurkin's digital toolkit, and I've got a link to that in the document that I'll share with you. Um, um, he's a historian at uh, uh, Mary Washington in Virginia. It's a concept that helps, particip that ha helps participants make this leap. McClurkin notes that an important part of digital literacy is a willingness to experiment with a wide range of tools and to think critically and strategically about which tools will best serve the aims of a particular digital project. Students, asking students to select from or even assemble their own digital toolkit rather than simply working with assigned tools makes tooling a focal point of critical reflection. Collaboration, our second point, don't give you a second to read it. So collaboration is not only a key term in the digital humanities, but also a cornerstone concept in higher education, obviously. Many disciplines view it as a valuable research topic in its own right, and the scholarship of teaching and learning, or SOTL, provides a, ver a varied interdisciplinary research platform for weaving collaboration into, into pedagogy. DH values collaboration for many of the same reasons, and our institute discuss discussions often explore the promises and challenges of engineering intensive collaborations among students. Our institute also offers participants an expanded understanding and practice of collaboration rooted in DH's preference for interdisciplinary inquiry. 
Through class visits and workshops, we introduce faculty participants to a wide range of potential collaborators who might help them realize their assignment design. So we have someone to come in to talk to faculty about intellectual property. We have instructional designers come in to talk about doing assignment design. We have libra librarians coming in talking about information architecture. We always bring in people to show that, that Really, the digital humanities is not going to be you working on your own, but it, you, to open up a network of possible collaborators that you can work with with your students. On our campus, experts in technology, instructional design, assessment, and intellectual property are not part of a single organization. Having other stakeholders participate in the institute helps participants to build their assignments, certainly, an aspect of the institute that is that highly valuable, according to our, value, uh, to our valuations. Beyond its immediate utility, this method provides a practical way of building a digital humanities culture on campus because we have people from all over campus involved in the project in one form or another. Brian Alexander and Rebecca Frost Davis have observed that unbundling the, uh, sorry, unbundling the uh, dominant research center model in favor of a networked approach like this might be a favorable strategy for nurturing DH and liberal arts institutions like ours. So you guys like us, we don't have the, it's not within our institutional remit, nor do we have the money to set up a center for the digital humanities. It's not, we just don't have that focus. But a network of people who might be involved in doing that is certainly something that's realizable. And it's also nice and flexible. It can change and grow depending on the needs of a particular year. So a network, it kind of makes sense. We're talking about networked culture. So to form a kind of an institutional formation that is itself a network is a very viable way of going about producing a digital humanities culture. Um, uh, it fosters coalitions of like-minded colleagues across campus, and it draws on existing computing resources to promote DH-oriented projects. Production. So production is a challenge on liberal arts campuses. DH as a field takes production seriously. Indeed, many large-scale projects build the tools in-house to accomplish the project's goals. So if you look at the Stanford uh, Digital Humanities website, for example, you'll see huge data mining projects, you'll see mapping projects. There's a project coming out of San, Di San Diego uh, where uh, they're looking at Instagram photographs. So they're, they're looking at millions and millions of photographs and they're building the tools to do that on site. They're employing coders, they're getting multi-million dollar grants. That's not, I mean, that take, one grant like that takes years of preparation and doing, right? And, and then you need a kind of a center architecture to do that. We don't really have the opportunity to do that in schools like ours, but um, there is a different way of thinking about doing production by using simpler tools. While we introduce such projects as um, the kinds of projects I'm talking about at Stanford, we tend to distill their high-tech approaches into tools and methods more suited to the undergraduate classroom. For example, after showing the website of a sophisticated text mining project from the Digital Scholarship Lab at the University of Richmond, we introduce Google's Ngram Viewer, which lets us gra users graph the incidence of words and phrases over time across its vast collection of digitized books. So it's free, it's easy to use, you put in a term and it'll show you how many time, times that term came up in all of the scanned books that Google has over 200 years, and it'll show you graphs of that use, right? There are universities building tools to do more advanced versions of that, but you can mobilize that concept really, really easily in an undergraduate classroom just using a Google tool. Um, most of the, the tools we introduce, including uh, uh, tools like Storify, ThingLink, Comic Life, and Canva, and we can talk about those in the discussion, are inexpensive or freely and easily learned. We also throw into the mix more ambitious tools, such as the Omeka platform and its, uh, and its image annotation plug-in Neatline that are supported by our Center for Instructional Technology. So Mecca is a digital archive uh, project that um, is built at George Mason University. Um, it's, uh, it's got Dublin Core metadata capabilities and it's a great way to build uh, museum grade um, exhibitions. Uh, this approach aligns with Adeline uh, Coe's proposal that the digital humanities should make room for relatively easy technologies that allow humanists to stay true to their core skills and priorities, including pedagogy. By offering a way to introduce digital humanities methods into the undergraduate classroom without toppling the curricular goals of the course or placing unrealistic demands on instructors, thoughtfully simplifying tools make it possible for digital techniques such as topic modeling, distant reading, and spatial analysis to infuse and invigorate humanities pedagogy. While each of the CCPO values overlap, we have come to understand openness, our fourth value, as an overarching value that informs and even transforms the others. <laughs> um, 
Openness invites attention to open access scholarship and tools, intellectual property and accessibility. Most importantly for the goals of our institute, openness asks instructors to consider expanded audiences for student work. As participants build their assignment designs, we ask them to think about the reach of their work, in particular an audience for the assignment beyond the classroom and the final appraisal of the instructor. What work does this assignment do in the world? The straightforwardness of this question belies the difficulty of the challenge it poses. Asking our instructors and students to open their class-based learning to media-rich work for broader publics clearly raises the stakes of an assignment. This understanding of openness can push against the temporal bounds of the semester. If the work produced by students will exist beyond to the end of the class, can it be picked up by future, future iterations of the class or other classes for further development, for example? So this fits in well, very well, clearly with a kind of a civic engagement mission. If you're going to be working with community partners and having either collaborating with outside organizations or writing for real audiences, that to me is the kind of overarching ethic of digital humanities work, is how can we make our students uh, uh, knowledge making do real work in the world. I want to take a break from the presentation just to show you some assignments that um, uh, have come out of the Institute and some others that I think might be of uh, use. How are we doing on time, Kate? Because I never put on my timer. It's 12.02. Which means, how long have we been talking? A uh, while. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think about 15 minutes. But I, yeah. Okay. All right. So. I'm going to show you, so okay, um, I've got the digital toolkit here, I'll be able to share that with you. Here's a project called Studio 395, which was developed by uh, two uh, history professors, and it basically rewrites the, um, the historical methods course in our university. It's actually going to become the core way to, that the, the methods course in that discipline will, will, will roll. And what the students do is they pick an archival topic, they do uh, primary research, and in teams, they then create an NPR-style podcast about that particular um, artifact. So you have one person who has done the research, and then you have an interviewer, and they go into a little soundproof room, and they do a kind of a Terry Gross in it, where they sit and go, well, John, tell me about this particular issue. And uh, so you can, each of these is a blog post. Um, uh, maybe that's not actually. <laughs> uh, what is that link to? <laughs> the joys of live media. So, okay, so the rise and fall, a comparison of leadership in the Eastern Front. Um, this paper attempts to research and cover the wide range of leadership styles in the Eastern Front in the Second World War, and maybe we'll be able to hear about this. Hello, my name is Kit Churchman, and this is with Studio 395, and today I will be interviewing Zach Salinkis. Hi. Um... Well, why don't you just start off? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wrote. So it's turned out to be a really great success because it really forces the students to take, to make that, that archival object living in a way and to present it uh, in a way that uh, 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 an audience can appreciate beyond the, the instructor. And after a couple of iterations of the course, of course you have the students listening to the previous students' work and then they're trying to raise the bar on what they're doing. So it's turned into a really, um, it's, uh, it, what I'm really interested about, as someone who teaches the Institute, I'm really interested in the fact that it has actually impacted the way that an entire department teaches its research methods to its upcoming students. And that to me is really valuable in the sense of how an assignment can become bigger than the sum of its parts, right? That it begins to actually ripple through the culture, the intellectual culture of a department. Um, okay, so this is from an English department. It's called Virginia Woolf in Time and Space. And this was a modernist, it's an upper division course. And uh, Sean White, the instructor, worked with her students to create uh, a range of um, uh, digital artifacts around the modernist period. It started with a timeline. So the students built this timeline over the course of the semester where they basically mapped modernism. And they wrote little, um, little tiny little articles for the, uh, uh, for the timeline. Um, that then that are actually blog posts on the site as well, so you can click through, and you can find um, um, the, the history of, of modernism as through the lens of Virginia Woolf's life. Uh, the tool is called Timeline JS. It's developed at Northwestern University. It's it's free. It's open source. It's developed. It's developed primarily for academic use. 
Um, it's totally, it's not totally easy to use actually, but it's, <laughs> it's not difficult to use. And it's very, it's a very uh, good tool for collaboration because the students actually write into a, they can include images. So if you have an assignment that is temporarily based, it's a great way to kind of get that kind of interactivity. The timeline itself can be embedded into any, any web page, you can embed it in a Facebook post, you can embed it into a blog post, but it's a really, really fantastic tool. And she basically remixed a lot of the student work throughout the site. So there's a map um, of uh, different important points, which is simply done through Google Maps. There's lots of uh, different mapping tools that uh, we, can, we can take a look at, but Google Maps, you can actually go in, create your own maps, edit them, put in videos and, and images. Um, uh, these are the posts that, uh, that, you can, that are actually linked to in the timeline, so there's different ways of reading the students' work. This is what I, I love this. This is a visualizations where uh, she asked the students to visualize the structure of Virginia Woolf's novels on an actual image. So if you click on any of these, you'll see that they're, um, th these are annotat annotatable images. And if you click on something, Ah, it's this one. So this image um, is a visualization of the waves, and if you hover over these parts, uh, it's, 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 it's um, uh, interpreting the waves through how uh, images of the body or metaphors <coughs> of the body um, uh, are infused through the novel. So we see left brain, we see right brain, we see heart, we see hands. Um, just these really interesting ways for students to recontextualize the themes of the novel and this tool ThingLink, and you can annotate any 2D surface on ThingLink, right? So it's super easy to, uh, you can put in images, you can put in videos to create annotations of images and then of course embed them in any kind of a website is also very easy to use. Um, uh, then we've got uh, uh, bios of the, the people in most life, and of course the class itself, right? And you know, again, the, 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 the ethos of the, or the identity of the class is really important to these projects because they are these projects are live, they're available to the world, they're going to become the text, part of the text of the next iteration of the class. So there's a way that the individual iterations are going to kind of build on each other and build on the quality of each other. Um, I'm going to, uh, uh, this is a project I developed myself over um, um, the last three or four years about first year writing. Um, so uh, what, I, what I've been doing in first year writing class, we now have eight instructors doing this. We have hundreds of first year writers producing their own magazines. And uh, they create um, uh, articles at the end of the semester in a variety of genres, but they do it in what I call a flow of media. So they move from paragraphs into, into video. I'm going to show you one. Uh, like this one, for example. They move from paragraphs of text into video um, at seamlessly. So the, te the video is just not there. It's actually taking the place of a paragraph or it's informed by what's going before. So what I'm asking the students to do is actually less about the technology than it is what's the best way to tell this story. Right? And they're exactly the critical thinking skills that we want to be kind of uh, uh, infusing our students with, particularly in first-year seminars, and they get the chance to, uh, to, to try um, um, uh, different, different ways of articulating ideas as paragraph units, right? So again, it's really, the focus is on the expression, it's on, about, it's on the writing. Um, I didn't teach any of these technologies necessarily in the class. They, the students created media according to their own comfort level or what they wanted to do. But the whole idea was that text is not the only modality that we're working in, right? That a paragraph of written text might not be the best way to um, uh, render this idea and to create seamless um, uh, reading experience between text and other kinds of media is the idea behind the project. Um, back to mapping. Uh, a uh, history professor who does local history, a very strong local history program at JFU, uh, asked his students to go out and to provide a walking tour of historical buildings in the city. So they're small audio podcasts. Um, uh, this is a, a WordPress site that has a Google Maps plugin. The whole site is basically one annotated map. Um, so you click on a, po a, a different point and there you have the actual, that's the Google Maps uh, um, uh, image rendering, and the history of that, Jess's Quick Lunch, which is a major institution in Harrisonburg, um, that's the, uh, uh, the story behind Jess's Lunch. 
So uh, there's multiple ways that you, again, Google Maps is easy to use, but you can create an entire fabric for an assignment or even a kind of a unit for a course that can be continued and developed over a number of different semesters. Um, uh, last summer I brought uh, it being St. Patrick's Day, I thought I'd put this up. As you can tell, <laughs> I'm, I'm from Ireland and I got the chance to bring 18 students back to uh, the home country for six weeks during the summer and we created a travelogue of our trip. Again, this is a WordPress site with a theme that just is, is map driven and you can, you can uh, uh, basically follow the map through our entire, uh, through our entire um, uh, journey. So there's ways you can like make this if you have alternative spring breaks, or I, I understand that your January uh, semester you tend to go abroad quite a bit. There's a way that you can turn this into uh, a living archive of work that uh, on trips like that. Um, one more project, uh, the Shenandoah Living Archive. I think it's really important that um, if you guys have special collections in your libraries or working with the libraries is a really great way to, to foster digital humanities projects. Um, um, I worked with the special collections at JMU to take a number of different artifacts and to have students work on uh, really fun exhibits to create a kind of a participatory archive, which we're calling the Shenandoah Living Archive. And we developed a couple of prototype exhibits for it. Uh, one of them being, uh, there was an 1855 cookbook um, that uh, uh, one of the group projects was to, we digitized the cookbook um, and then we took some of the recipes and went down to the local farmer's market and cooked them and filmed the event. So uh, there's a, uh, we had one of our, um, we had an instructor, the, the, the amazing Tassie no, Pippers. Help us do that. It's handwritten, and um, as you can see here, this is the handwriting from one of the recipes. Um, the handwriting is absolutely incredibly beautiful, but dif difficult. One of the difficulties, actually, there was no um, measurements. So they had to make all of the recipes with no measurements. It was just like <laughs> lard. <laughs> 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 so, you know, there's lots of different ways. Again, this, this, this actually required no more technology than what we have here today, which is like having one camera with a mic down at the farmer's market with this event. The students went out and bought all of the um, uh, ingredients at the farmer's market. We cooked it there. It, we, we had someone who really knew how to cook. That was a help. Um, um, and uh, it, was, it was a great event that sort of like actually did some really good community relations and we've got a lot more people, a lot more students getting involved in the farmer's market. Um, I think I'll go back to the presentation for now. I can show you a bunch more stuff um, from there. I just want to kind of um, conclude the talk part of this and let us go on to having a conversation about things. Um, yes, okay. So, assignments such as these encourage the cross-fertilization of ideas, modes, methods, and disciplinary, interdisciplinary, and disciplinary worldviews that with careful nurturing could grow into a solid and recognizable pattern of interdisciplinary digital humanities practice on any campus. Following Virginia Kuhn and Vicki Callahan, we believe that such work can be transformative. Kuhn and Callahan celebrate the fact that the digital humanities is not a, un a unified field, noting that its relative murkiness is rich with potential. They urge us to approach digital humanities not in terms of more traditional horizontal forms of interdisciplinarity, which is, you know, like my discipline plus benefits. Do you know what I mean? The, that kind of version of interdisciplinarity is like, yes, I want to be interdisciplinary, but we'll do it my way, and then you'll give us a little bit of a kind of a spin in it. This is like a lot of what we're seeing happening is instructors getting together and coming up with something that neither of them or if it's a group would have been able to envisage beforehand and that's really the transformation is trying to go to what people are calling transdisciplinarity right rather than it being between disciplines a kind of a property that exceeds tradition uh, uh, disciplinary thinking um, they are, just, uh, they are just to approach DH, not in terms of more traditional horizontal forms of interdisciplinarity, where resources are connected without substa a substantial alteration to the structure of a discipline, but as a kind of vertical interdisciplinarity, where there is a rich layering in both method and practice of teaching and scholarship that poses challenges to the very discursive categories employed. We have found their, their discussion useful in understanding the extraordinary collaborative energy that filled the room during the showcase presentations and that we're beginning to build over the last couple of years of doing uh, the Institute at, at JNU. Our experience of designing and teaching the Institute has convinced us that without the right approach to DH pedagogy, there, that, 
that the relative murkiness of DH is likely to be more confusing than enlivening. And the potential, uh, her, the potential held by Kuhn and Callahan is, likely to be, uh, is unlikely to be realized. When we, begin planning our, when we began planning our institute three years ago, we struggled with the task of introducing something so varied and multiform. How do you teach a field you can't define? For us, the answer came in creating a framework of values that conveyed several core con concerns of DH practitioners, while highlighting DH's relevance to the mission of our institution. While we settled on this framework early on, it was only in the classroom and over time that its power became clear. Among its key strengths is its minimalism. By avoiding the quagmire of defining DH and emphasizing values that speak to both method and practice, teaching and scholarship, the CCPO framework taps into, rather than squelching, the lively diversity within DH. We see it as a means of harnessing creative potential rather than codifying or defining practice for inspiring rather than limiting. <coughs> For those who might be interested in experimenting with similar or, re or related ventures within their own institutions, such as here, I'd like to conclude with some practical advice. Teach DH around values rather than starting with particular methodologies or theories. Develop a values framework that speaks to the mission and specific concerns of, your, of Wofford. Be tactical, but have fun. Revel in the spirit of play and inquisitiveness and open-ended experimentation that drives DH. Don't obsess about technical competency. Don't be scared off by the scale and technical sophistication of some high-end projects that you might see on the web. The principles and concerns of the work can likely be tapped into with fewer resources and less advanced technologies than you might expect. Sometimes your students will help you out with the technology. Often you will only need to work closely with, often you will need to work closely with tech, technical experts on your campus, not simply as resources, but as co-creators. Take advantage of opportunities to collaborate with staff and faculty across the disciplines in different ways, experimenting and brainstorming in the new vocabulary of DH that accommodates insights and approaches from all fields. Be prepared for assignment ideas that reinvigorate or reconfigure curricular goals and maybe even generate research agendas that involve students and faculty across multiple years. A well-designed DH pedagogy has the potential to embrace the values that brought you to the humanities in the first place and to cultivate the fresh insights and encounters that will help keep those values vital. So thank you for uh, listening to the presentation part. I've got a little handout with the values um, uh, that I've talked about. And what I was thinking we'd do for 15 or 20 minutes is just, uh, thanks, uh, thanks John, um, is just take a look at them and see what sense they make to you. You might want to think about them in terms of like, huh, I wonder could I rethink an assignment I have through these four values? I wonder is there a way that I might develop a new assignment for a particular class that you're thinking of teaching using these values? So now it's in a mind map form, so if you read it clockwise, the four values are on the right-hand side of the mind map, and then the left-hand side is actually drilling down into more specifics about like, okay, how long is it going to be? Are you, is it going to be a week, a unit, a, um, a whole semester? Um, you might not get to the